working. I forgot. He did the English channel. Yeah, that was kind of was supposed to be the idea was that it was supposed to be the lightest thing. NASA one cool. Now I wonder are the wings truncated or are they just not there? They didn't have these handles in the actual cargo bay, by the way. So they also didn't have the green exit sign. Yes. <laughs> yeah, they eliminated the exit sign so they didn't know how to go across. Yeah, I, I just... Even though you're weightless and still you wind up banging things. And... <laughs> 
I'm going to go into uh, some of the paired stuff. Um, after that, we'll have uh, an open mic for anybody who wants to come up uh, to say a thing or two about mom sharing memories. Um, but first, to uh, tell about mom's, mom's early years as a child and into college and afterwards, uh, we've got our, uh, my aunt, Aunt Elaine, her first sister. Really good. 
good at all the Girl Scout stuff, from crafts to sewing to starting campfires. <laughs> the first year in Lakewood, we lived in a rental behind the Villa Plaza shopping center. Lisa attended first grade at Park Lodge. Even at six, Lisa had a natural charm and was very sociable. There was a family who lived down the road from us. Lisa made friends with the children. And years later, when we were both in college, a young man asked me if I was Lisa's sister and could he have her phone number. <laughs> <laughs> when he told me his name, I remembered that he was one of the kids who lived down the road from us. The next year, we moved to our new home. No, yep. <laughs> okay. Yes, that is the right slide. The next year we moved to our new home, and we started our cat collection, two little boys, Blackie and Tommy. We later, later added two little girls, Twinkle Toes and Zipper. With four unneutered cats, we quickly had, not quite, millions of cats. <laughs> later thought was the inspiration for wanting lots of little fur balls. <laughs> I am pretty sure that since that time, Lisa has never been without a fur companion. We spent Thanksgiving with our friends the Snodgrasses. Either they came up to our house or we went down to theirs in Portland, Oregon. Later, after both our families got cabins, we'd visit each other in the warmer months. When we were older, we would either spend a month in the summer in Canada with the Britons, who were more family friends, or run down to Oregon to see the Ashland Shakespearean Festival. Am I on the right side? Yes. All right. That is Ashland. The exception was the year we went to Disneyland. <laughs> Dad had a small boat, and we officially became shipwrecks. <laughs> and spent a weekend each summer scraping barnacles off the hull. When Lisa was in seventh grade, Dad and Mom pulled her and me out of school to take a sailboat cruise in the British Virgin Islands. Later, Dad bought a fiberglass hull to finish out into a larger boat for the family to cruise in. Took long enough that we never went on any cruises in it. <laughs> we walked to Idlewild Elementary, bus to Mann Junior High, and to Lakes High School. Until Lisa got her driver's license. Then she got to drive the family car, a Spitfire, to high school. Coolest girl, that's not a secret for you. <laughs> Coolest girl in school. Lisa learned to play chess, and took ballet and piano lessons in elementary school. <laughs> she later learned to play the guitar. We went to hear concerts by the Irish Rovers and see performances by Joffrey Ballet. While in high school, Lisa was a member of the folk dancing club, usually chosen to be the dance partner of our guest instructor. <laughs> French club, Drama Club. She played Titania in Shakespeare's Midsummer Night Dream and a dead body in Arsenic and Old Lace. <laughs> <laughs> That's her in the black jacket. <laughs> and of course, Honor Society. The summer after her last year of high school, we all worked at the Lakewood Playhouse, set building, singing backups. She was the little girl in the children's show Blue Kangaroo. Dancing group and was generally more support. There was 
the usual sibling rivalry. Yeah. There was the usual sibling rivalry, but Lisa was a really good sister to have. She paved the way for her introverted younger sister to become involved in all the clubs she was in and buffered the anxiety of moving away to college. When she graduated Western Washington University, it changed its standing while she was there. She got a job with Martin Marietta and moved to Louisiana. At that point in time, we both got involved in our separate lives, so I'm going to pass the mic to David so he can tell of life after college. Okay, I'm going to do the overrides. It's amazing. I'm going to have a lot of great pictures. Um, so I'm going to have to see what I'm See what you're showing and tell you back and forth. Okay, so, uh, first, there we go. Good. Um, as you heard, Elaine said that in 1981, uh, she moved to Slidell, took up a, an apartment. Um, <clears throat> at my liberty, I had an apartment at the Eden Apartments. Uh, went to work at Martin. The Shooter's Assembly Facility. We worked in the building in the far right there. The assembly building, of course, that big monstrosity there. And that was the big tall building is where they would paint the, uh, the external tank with the blade material. And then they would run it up. The, when it was done, um, they'd come out of that last building, and then they'd pipe it all the way back to the canal, and then get it on a barge and then head it to the floor. I believe they made 130 of them. <clears throat> the first one was white and all of them after that were brown. Um, we worked, and yes, that's a Saturn fire at the front, the bottom one. Um, we worked in an area called Advanced Programs, um, which uh, would take um, most of the work was taking this shuttle, basic design, you know, adding jig and wings to it, see if we could get a new mission out of it. Um, so most of the work was just theoretical and, and uh, on computers and on paper. Uh, I worked the computer that worked in there, that was a prime computer, and uh, together, uh, Lisa and I did work on the project. We, uh, Converted a program called Post, which is a, 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 a trajectory optimization program. We converted from Vibes to uh, Prime, and I believe it was the first and only thing they ever sold <laughs> in that program. Um, yeah, that's the uh, Enterprise. You can see the E of Enterprise, but. Uh, that's she and I. Um, this, by the way, picture was taken at um, New Orleans World's Fair. And we had the official at that. Um, <clears throat> uh, I don't recall when, yeah, it must have been 1984. Uh, Next picture. Uh, as you know, she was in theater. And uh, fortunately, Slidell had a theater, and she uh, performed a, as the uh, female lady in the play, um, The Rainmaker. That's her. Um, I think we made a movie that starts with the Korean. We didn't catch it yet. Um, at one time, the, uh, the company sent us to San Francisco to learn Haven. And uh, while I was there, my good friend Jim, he's the guy on the left, worked at Calif uh, the California State as an archaeologist. And without even giving him a hint at what our relationship was at the time, he came, Lisa and I had a suite of rooms next to each other at the hotel in downtown San Francisco. He came over, used my room, and put me in her room. <laughs> and then, the day later, his wife came over and joined him. And uh, so he, he, because he worked for the state of California, he got a free ride, thanks to 
Lockheed Martin, um, to stay at a nice fancy downtown hotel while he did his work. He had some work at uh, Candlestick Park looking for you know, artifacts and Indian millions and whatever. Um, in return, at the end of that uh, week, um, we turned the car in at the airport and he drove us to his dad's place at Cameron Air Park where he owns a plane, a Cessna 172. Um, so I had flown with Jim's plane many times before. I was a good friend of Jim's. And so when I got in the plane, I took the back seat with Jim's wife. And Lisa said, oh, good, I, I prefer to sit up in the front. And then Jim said, here's the throttle. There's your altimeter, there's your artificial horizon, and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> when we landed, I took this picture, and that's her telling me, never do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but we did land safely. This is a picture of us at Lake Tahoe. He flew from Sacramento to the top, or I should say, Lisa flew us. <coughs> uh, next picture. In uh, 1985, we moved from um, Louisiana uh, <coughs> to back here to Seattle. Um, it doesn't show up here. I have a picture in the <coughs> all the way from Louisiana to Washington, and we went actually west and then north. And uh, we drove uh, all that way, all of the clothes we were going to wear in two months, me and her in an ARC-7 and two cats. <laughs> 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 um, I had a job immediately, we lived out of our hotel, for a couple months until we rented a house and went Kent. But uh, she got a job, her first job there, working for Boeing on the ASAP program. This is what it does. An F 15 flies with a rocket and it shoots the rocket and it takes out a satellite. All the thing that she had done before and after was putting satellites up. This thing took them out. <laughs> and they took out an old satellite. Uh, it's the only one they did, you know, test for it, and that was the end of it. The following year, in March, we got married. And, well, in August, we had Bethany, you do the math. <laughs> After, um, I believe 19, I guess I have here, it's 1988. Um, she went to work on Queen Match. Back, back, there. She worked on Queen Match. And when they uh, advertised it to her, they said, oh yeah, we're going to be tracking missiles out of Kauai, uh, <clears throat> Barking Sands, Hawaii, to Kalajalee. And so you'd be working on the Hawaiian Islands. But when she joined, it got sent to Shenna, <laughs> <laughs> which is an old Inuit name meaning nowhere. <laughs> the, I, I don't have a picture of it, I should show you. you go look at it, you can see the pictures of Shenna. Anyways, it's a, they have lots of jokes there. Um, one was, there was a girl behind every tree. There are no trees. <laughs> she had, she had t-shirts from there that said, Shenya, right. it's not the end of the world, but you can see it from there. <laughs> you could, one of the things they did in their minimal free time is you could start out at the point on the western part of the island, jump in the water and swim, you know, a few, maybe 20, 30 feet, and get out and then say, you swam from the Pacific Ocean to the Bering Sea. <laughs> <laughs> Next picture. 
And I have it here at 1990. Um, she worked on the seven alarm systems in, in Everett. Um, Jay was a little youngster at the time, very young. And so it was in Everett. So she, she, we had to uh, commute from West Seattle to Everett every day, but fortunately, Jay sat in the passenger seat in his, in his uh, child seat, and um, hopefully the cops would know that she was driving the HOV with one of the passengers. <laughs> <coughs> so she used Jay for that. <laughs> and, uh, after working on Triple Seven in '90, she worked. Uh, oh. 19, oh, I have it, 1994 question, uh, she joined Sea Launch. Uh, sea Launch was a multinational joint operation uh, involving uh, Russia, Ukraine, Norway, and Norway. Um, what they did was they, this, they would take a converted oil, uh, ocean oil trailer, with put motors on it somehow and have it uh, <clears throat> sail itself. And they would come in in a command ship, a much obviously much bag, bigger ship. I don't have a picture over here, but you can look at it. Um, and they would float it out to the equator somewhere, somewhere southwest of Hawaii, and launch a Russian proton rocket with the satellites on it. Lisa rode on the command launch for the very first one, and I don't know if this is the, uh, hers, that trip they launched the satellite responsible for direct TV, so we can blame her. <laughs> <laughs> she worked on also like other things they did with Sirius X and, and, and amongst other uh, satellites. 2006, she left Boeing. Uh, an old manager of hers invited her to uh, join a company called Andrew Space, named after the founder. It's later was called Space Flight Industries when she finally left it around 2011. Uh, she was laid off then. Um, what she worked on mostly was uh, with a company called ATK, which was left over from Thiokol, for those of you who know that, which is located in Provo, Utah, so she would make trips to uh, Utah, Salt Lake, and drive out to Port po Provo, and working on the ALS, which stands for the Advanced Wall System, which was the next big thing after the space shuttle. In 2011, she was laid off and took classes at this school, which for those of you who know, is that one. Yes. <laughs> um, she took classes uh, to become a teacher and certified. She got her certificate, I believe, in 2013. Uh, up until then, she worked uh, as a substitute. And then at 13, she uh, worked full time as the freshman math teacher and beginning program. During the time she mentored the uh, school science Olympiad program, and across the street in the summer she mentored for the Washington Aerospace Scholars. In 2016 of October, she was diagnosed with terminal cancer and retired from material from the <clears throat> medical reasons. And that concludes uh, her life. Um, I don't know about the oh. Is there anybody else? Do we have anybody else? Yes, Jay. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so, uh, I'm not actually sure what I'm going to say. This is going to be a bit of improv for me. Um, in uh, true aviation high school fashion, I was working on my part of the presentation right up until the time we had to present. Um, but I want to start with this. Mom told me that she was proud of me. Um, this was long before the cancer and even longer before I graduated. 
uh, a little bit of context for this. Uh, Mom's father, Ray Lai, was an orthopedic surgeon. He raised her on Star Trek and uh, sci-fi magazines. Um, and even though she told me once his, uh, his idea for a good job for her was to be a court stenographer, uh, <laughs> he saw her uh, become a mathematician, work on, you know, amazing engineering projects, work with computers, and one of the things that she always said to me was that you do your best to raise your children to be better than you are. Um, she was very proud of Beth and I for getting into engineering and uh, working on some of the things that uh, she wished she'd gone to school for and getting to see some of the things that we were getting to learn and do uh, both in high school and in college. Um, when I was little, uh, mom was my world. I was a uh, was mom's world. <laughs> Uh, that was a bit ironic because I was also the problem child. <laughs> I had a temper, uh, and it ended up ending me up in the uh, principal's office uh, very frequently. But she was very patient with me. She listened to what I had to say. She taught me that my voice and my opinion was something that was valued. Um, and I think that's one of the reasons why I became as patient as I am, as persistent as I am. Um, when I was in, when I was in middle school, uh, I don't know if, uh, how many of you people saw this, but I went to see the film, uh, Artificial Intelligence in theaters, <laughs> and that messed me up. <laughs> It uh, confronted me with something that I hadn't considered up until then, and kind of stuck with me ever since. That someday I would have to say goodbye. And as the years went on, and I broke away from that house and uh, started my, my, my years in college, um, West Seattle was always home for me. And I remember coming over, uh, over the mountains every time and getting to see uh, the Pacific Northwest, the vibrant green after the uh, you know, endless ocean of uh, amber waves. <laughs> it, was always, it was always comforting to me. And uh, as I began to m carve out a place for myself in Pullman, um, I started living on my own money. I started, uh, you know, living in my own place, in a space where I had, had my own control. I found that West Seattle was no longer home for me. And I started separating from mom a little bit. I no longer revolved around her. I had my own things. I had my own desires. And when, when I got news of the cancer, um, there was kind of this calm sense of, I don't know quite how to describe it. I guess, this is what's next. It was just a matter of fact. And every year, um, we weren't sure if it was going to be mom's last. I was still in college, um, but I was uh, closer to Seattle than, than Beth was. And so I made a point of coming out and taking care of mom and however I could. Um, and. Uh, 
making the best of the time that I have. And I'm proud to say two things. That the first was that I managed to graduate before, <laughs> before she died. I decided that that was one of the things that I wanted to, wanted to do because I wanted to show her that I had made it, that all of her years of being patient with me, of teaching me, of you know, turning me into the person that I am now, all of them went somewhere. And I'm proud to say that I continued to make new memories with mom, find new connections with her. Um, mom was very uh, active at Aviation High School, um, but one of the things that I, I don't know many of you uh, are aware of, um, she was also, I don't know how to describe it, she was a nerd! Um, <laughs> she made a point of going out to various different conventions around here. Uh, the Steampunk Conventions, Emerald City Comic Con, um, the Geek Girl Convention. And I was the one who would take her. And so I got to spend days, exhausting and aggravating though they were, I got to spend whole days um, with Mom, going and, and, and seeing and doing things with her. And then, uh, when Beth returned from, from New Zealand, we started uh, having, having a family game night um, and uh, forming, forming memories, uh, playing with her at the, the local gaming cafe. And so, we, at the beginning, weren't sure how long long would last. Uh, we were given a prognosis that, um, for the most part, uh, if you survive the first hundred days, then things kind of plateau from there. Um, and so, we were lucky. Mom managed, managed to persist, and we got three really wonderful years. And so, after three years of uh, staring this in the face, and doing our level best to care for her, to form memories with her, and to stay by her and, and do right by her. Um, on September 15th, Mom passed away. I was uh, I was ignoring my alarm at the time that I got the call. And uh, even before I saw who was calling, I knew what it was about. And so I called out of work and went over to West Seattle, cross town traffic, and um, saw her out of the house. And I had gotten the idea um, a couple months previous, after burying, burying two of our cats, <laughs> ironically, uh, I got the idea that I wanted to help bury Mom. A bit of context. Mom was a very pragmatic woman, and uh, she didn't really care too much about what happened after she died. Uh, she wanted to have a green burial, which I can understand entirely. She wanted to be returned to the earth um, without all the preserving chemicals, without a casket. Um, she was allowed to return to the carbon cycle. And that's beautiful. And there's something very cathartic 
about hard work. Um, and I think it was, it was my, when I voiced the desire to uh, be there when mom died, when I voiced the desire to uh, help bury her, I think that triggered something with my, with my sister and my father. And so, um, about, what, two weeks afterwards, um, we all drove up north. And it was a, a gray and overcast day, just the way Mom reflected. <laughs> and we buried Mom. And then we had a, a walk in a nearby park. It was calm. It was quiet. It was good. And so all of that is what I mean when I say it was a good death. For uh, my other thought, one last thing that I'll leave you with, uh, for somebody who uh, didn't really care much what happened after she died, mom was getting quite the send off. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, uh, sorry about rambling a little bit. I think that's where my story is. Thank you very much.